Well, I want to welcome our audience to today's program uh, on business decision making, especially in times of crisis. Today, you're going to hear about strategies to bring sound, measured, and fact-based decision making to your organization. We're going to hear the theory, the science, and some application today of some key concepts that can help you make better decisions in times of crisis and change. My name is Michael Fedor. I'm the Vice President of Advancement and Strategic Initiatives at Central Penn College. Central Penn College is a career-focused institution of higher education, delivering experiential learning opportunities in person and online in associate's, bachelor's, and master's degree programs, as well as certificates and non-credit professional training programs, including our newest program in telemedicine, which is launching on May 18th. Since 1881, Central Penn College has been offering well-rounded education that provides our students with the opportunity to grow, not only in their education and in their profession, but as individuals as well. Check us out at centralpen.edu. On today's episode, I'm going to be uh, having a conversation with three accomplished professionals from our college. Let me introduce them to you now. Dr. Linda Fedrizi Williams became the 10th president of Central Penn College in 2018. She holds a doctorate in higher education and organizational change from Benedictine University and Benedictine University uh, and a master's in organizational communication from Marist College. Welcome, Linda. Good morning, Michael. Doug Fisher is the Interim Chair of Business, Accounting, and Communications and Graduate Studies at Central Penn College. Doug built and taught over one dozen theoretical business classes and is part of our design and instruction team for our innovative new Corporate Custom Certificate Program. Doug teaches from his experience as a successful president of four companies, including a tech firm he founded and sold. Doug also works with business owners assisting them in building lasting, successful companies that create better lives for many people. Welcome, Doug. Thank you, Michael. Dr. Jack Babinchak is an associate professor in the School of Professional Studies, where he teaches both undergraduate and graduate business and leadership courses. He received his PhD in 2012 in organizations and management with a focus on organizational psychology. His research interests include positive organizational behavior and decision-making, two issues very close to my heart. Jack, welcome, good morning. Thank you, Michael. I want to welcome the three of you to the program today. Like me, I know you are uh, all on day 40-something of uh, the shelter and home or shelter at home order. Uh, we've all lost track. I hope that each of you is staying safe and healthy. Looks like you are, that's good. <laughs> Part of the reason for Central Penn College to produce this series is to help professionals in search of help and quality content during these unprecedented times. And today's program in particular is about business decision making in times of crisis and change. Each of you offers a unique perspective that I think our audience is going to find truly valuable. So thank you for taking the time today and let's get started. I wanna start with Doug. Uh, the first question is for you. What are you seeing in the marketplace in terms of changes in business decision-making since this pandemic captured our attention? Well, that's an interesting question, Michael, and, and a good one. Uh, it, for me, it has been the most impactful aspect of running a business in terms of uh, the impact of this coronavirus crisis uh, or pandemic, if you will. Um, it, you know, there's two types of thinking if you really want to boil it all down. If you follow Kahneman, you know that there's, you know, fast and slow uh, thinking or system one and system two thinking. And I'd like to first explain what what slow thinking is or system two thinking, and that is the more cognitive uh, consideration. So when you're making a decision and you're using system two thinking, you're using your brain, you're using evidence, you're taking the emotion out of it and uh, making decisions in that manner. Uh, unfortunately, in times of crisis, what happens to most business leaders and to most people in the grocery store or driving down the road uh, is that they result, they resolve to uh, uh, re or resort to uh, system one thinking, 
which is a more emotional, reactive type thinking where people are making their decisions based on how they feel and they feel somewhat intense and they feel anxiety and stress from the fact they've been cooped up in the same place so much with the same people so much and people start to drive a little faster and they start to react to things that would not normally upset them or make them make a decision real quickly. They might swag an estimate if they're uh, estimating the price for a customer. They might tend to just grab a, uh, a price out of the air or what we call swag it, um, it rather than actually calculating a real uh, effective scientific approach that would that would give them the best possible and most profitable price for that customer. So they're they're more likely to do things uh, quicker and uh, with less thought. So that's the real impact. Uh, I'll let Jack put meat on the bones of what I'm really talking about because he's the one that did his dissertation in this and he's a an expert on the science behind all of this. So I'll, I'll let him explain in more detail if that's okay. You know, I mean, I can relate to everything Doug said about kind of the reaction that some of us are feeling, especially after being cooped up. But Jack, can you tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, business decision making? Uh, and after a career of studying these subjects, what is the most academic ex explanation, I guess, of what uh, Doug just described? Sure. Let me just start by saying I'm so happy, Doug, that you referenced Kahneman and System 1 and System 2 so early in the conversation. Uh, but, but what Doug is saying makes uh, makes perfect sense. Right? We are living through very unique times right now, to say the least. And it's just adding layer and layer of complexity to the already difficult process of, of decision making. But let's take let's take a step back uh, real quick and look at the rational decision-making model, which pretty much says this is the way managers and leaders should be making decisions. And there's five steps to this model. The first step is to identify the problem or the challenge. The second step is to gather all available information. And that means all the information, not just partial information, but gather all the information that's available. Step through, step three is to come up with an exhaustive list of alternatives, right? And not only the alternatives, but what are the outcomes of, of those alternatives and what are the consequences of those alternatives? Step four is then go ahead and make your decision. And step five is to implement and, and gather some feedback. So if we just look maybe at the first two or three steps of that rational decision-making process, you could see where, uh, again, these times are adding layers of complexity. So first of all, um, you know, identify the problem or the challenge. This is like nothing we've ever seen before. We've had other viruses. We've had SARS and MERS and H1N1, but nothing of a, of a global economic shutdown um, and social distancing like we're seeing now. So we really can't bounce that off our brains and say, where have I seen that before? What was the result of that? Let me evaluate the outcome and in essence, predict maybe where we're going to be a few months from now. We just can't do that because we've never seen anything quite like this before. Uh, the second step, gather all the available information. I mean, we have mountains of information coming at us from a number of different, different sources, right? And the information that we thought we knew from a few weeks, so that is changing too, right? What are, what's the logarithmic curve of this thing? And uh, what are the symptoms of those? What's the contagion levels? The models that are coming out are changing all the time. And then you add to that maybe some misinformation that's going to be out there that you're, you're throwing into the mix. And now th there's a term called cognitive strain. And I think a lot of managers and leaders are experiencing cognitive strain, just trying to process all of this information that they're receiving every day. So to generating solutions becomes very, very difficult. And then like Doug said, you, you add an emotional layer onto there, right? We're worried about our students, our, our employees, our family, our friends, and it just complicates this decision-making process so much. Jack, you, know, cognitive, you mentioned cognitive strain. Is that that feeling after a long day that you just feel like you can't make another decision? I wouldn't even say a long day, Michael. The way things are going, maybe after a long hour, it's uh, it's difficult. <laughs> exactly. So, Linda, Central Penn College has been on top of a measured and strategic approach to trying to respond to this crisis um, and making decisions around COVID-19. Um, can you share some of uh, how your decision making was impacted by this crisis? Sure. It it's very much what Jack is saying and talking about. 
So the, the first thing is there's so many decisions that would normally be completely in our control that isn't. So we're, we have to take advice. There are a couple of things we can't control. We have to take advice from the governor and from the secretary of health orders. So there's that, right? And there's that piece of it. And then you are inundated every day with a lot of recommendations, publications about how other higher ed institutions are handling the situation, news reports and watching all different news channels so that you're getting as well-rounded information as possible. And you can't be reactionary, which is difficult when you're in the middle of a crisis. So it's taking a step back. Um, for me, it's reviewing all of that data constantly, looking and seeing how others are reacting, conferring with colleagues that I have, other presidents at higher ed institutions to talk about ways that they're handling the situation. And then I established right away a couple of task forces for myself. So we have a COVID-19 task force. It's made up of a variety of people at the college, our head of public safety, our head of facilities, we have a healthcare expert, our marketing and communications expert, human resources. We meet every week to talk about how all of these things we're learning about affect Central Penn specifically for the health and safety portion. And then I have a cabinet with executives that are all very different from me, and I want that. I want to hear other people's opinions. I, I take counsel from them. I go to them privately and ask their opinions. I have a director of my board of directors that I meet with. And then ultimately taking all of that information, taking a motion out of it, which is difficult, but you absolutely have to, and then making the best decision for Central Penn College. Also doubling down on our mission. What does our mission say? Who are we serving? How do we continue to serve them and deliver our mission and not stray, which can be tempting to do when there's when there's other avenues. And then once I make a decision, sticking with it and and making sure that I am moving forward and not second guessing and on to the, the next decision, because decision fatigue is very real. <laughs> <laughs> Very real. Yeah, sounds like you've got a lot on your plate, Linda. We really, uh, we, we thank you for your leadership of the college, and we also, you, you have our sympathies. I'm sure the, the amount of decisions you're making on a daily basis is overwhelming. So, Doug, I think clearly Central Penn College has come out of this the right way, right? Mm -hmm. We've heard Linda talk about um, hearing uh, about from a, you know, a variety of opinions and making informed decisions. Um, but like Central Penn, there's a lot of businesses, not only in our community, community but across the country, that are desperate to reopen. But um, they've not always demonstrated that they have a strategy or they have a process in place. Um, and so they might be rushing to reopen. And that can put some real strain on their, their organization. Tell us, Doug, how can leaders who are anxious to reopen make a business decision without panicking or coming off the rails? Uh, recognizing the urgency they have for returning revenues for their organization? Well, step one, Michael, is to, um, it, it's really to have knowledge about decision making. And that's why we're doing this call. I mean, that that is the, the sole purpose of this call is to help people uh, learn what they need to learn so they can make better business decisions. So the first part of that is really knowledge. Jack talked uh, extensively about uh, system one and system two thinking, learning to think slow, not fast, learning to be methodical. Another thing that business leaders have to clearly understand is that there are levels of clarity with regards to thinking through all the other aspects that Linda talked about with regards to all this, this data that comes at her from so many different directions. And, and it's been a few years for me, so I forgot uh, exactly what that feels like till she brought back those memories. But, uh, you know, you, you can hear a lot of voices if you're not yeah, real careful about how many voices you hear. And uh, the fact is, we have to really establish clarity in our minds in addition to thinking slowly. We have to truly understand the decision we're trying to reconcile with. And, and there are three levels of clarity that you go through intellectually to get to the point where you can actually state your problem and start the process of resolving it. The second component, like I said, is what we call the three levels of clarity. If you think about the the decisions, the tough ones that come to your to you as a business leader, and we're all business leaders, you the first thing that happens is it rattles around in our head, and and you walk around with that decision in your mind, sometimes for hours, sometimes for days, uh, occasionally for weeks. That you, it's just 
it's just in there, but you haven't really organized it yet. So uh, for lack of a better analogy, the butterflies are literally just fluttering everywhere. And uh, that, that problem or that issue or that opportunity that is on your mind with regards to a decision is at what we call level one clarity, which is it's just in your mind. Now, what I like to teach uh, both my students and my business leaders to do, because I teach them the exact same things, um, that is to get to level two clarity, we need to write out the problem. Uh, it needs to go from mind to paper. And what happens when we type or write a problem, uh, usually in the form of journaling, which is so, uh, a habit, a wonderful habit of many, many successful business leaders. Um, when you journal the issue that you are faced with, it becomes more organized in your mind. Suddenly you see structure, you see outline, and you feel like you have your arms in a better way around the decision you must make. And then eventually, when you get down towards the end of making a decision, you can achieve level three clarity, which is you actually verbalize the problem. You sit down with somebody you trust. And Linda alluded to this. She goes to her cabinet members one on one, verbalizes the problem. And that's brilliant. That's exactly what we should do uh, is to get with people we trust, verbalize the issue. And what really will surprise uh, business leaders about verbalizing the issue is many times by the time you verbalized it, you know the answer. You don't even need a response because just getting it out gives you that third level of clarity. And as I walk people through this exercise, what I often hear is, you know what? I know now because I said it and, and, it, and I got that that brilliant level of clarity that I couldn't have having just written it or just having it rattle around in my mind. And I know Jack can elaborate on Yeah, this. I was going to say, I'm going to bring Jack in here and ask him, so what's the value or the benefit of utilizing uh, these levels of clarity uh, in your business decision-making and your thinking? Yeah, and that's a, that's a great process that Doug just outlined there. And, and it, you can carry that through for the entire decision-making making process. I think I think he said we have a lot rattling around inside our heads and that is that is absolutely the truth. There is a lot. So we have to organize and somehow get it out. So, you know, the first step of thinking about it, I would, you know, I would certainly recommend getting away from all the noise right now and turn off the phone, turn off the TV. Uh, go by yourself somewhere and really think through it. And again, as Doug mentioned in his first um, part there, engage that system to level of thing, that cognitive planning, predicting part of your brain. And you do that by getting away from some of that noise. And then the, the, the second part of writing it down, uh, I, I, that's a great idea. And I would even add, write it down free flowingly, almost from your subconscious. Don't, don't think about what you're writing. Don't worry about punctuation. Don't worry about grammar. Just go ahead and write it out. And then there's a, there's a couple of benefits to that. One is you can go back and you could you could look at what you've written and say, what are some of the assumptions or beliefs that I'm holding about this situation that maybe I didn't even know that I had? So getting it down on paper journaling is, is a fantastic um, idea. And then the last one, um, talking it out certainly, certainly helps. Um, you could you could better identify maybe the root cause of what the problem is, identify some of the critical factors that we're seeing today, um, looking maybe initially at those who may be involved in this decision, who may be impacted. And then, you know, finding creative solutions and alternatives is is another benefit of doing that. So, you know, in essence, it's a, it's a, it's a great way to almost, it's a visualization exercise almost where we could, you know, we have a, we have a current state problem. And what we want to do is we want to visualize that ideal future state. And what are the challenges in getting to that ideal future state? And, that, and like I said, that's a great, that's a great process for getting through that. So, Linda, I, I know that you, <clears throat> you you put all of these three uh, levels of clarity into practice every single day. I've seen it at work. Um, and I know you can speak a little bit more about that heavy weight of responsibility you feel as a leader to make good decisions. And, you know, how do you find yourself moving through those levels of clarity and maybe provide the context, too, about, you know, the, the purpose, why you're here as a leader of a college, you know, who are you ultimately trying to think about when you're moving through these, these processes? And, and that's just it, Michael. So that's what I remind myself of constantly. 
the responsibility is huge in a normal circumstance. When you're not dealing with the health and safety of your entire student population, you already have that responsibility knowing that the decisions you make are impacting everyone where you are. And for me, that's students, but it's also faculty and staff. And there is a very, um, there's a tightrope right now. And there's a balance between the safety and the health of everyone that's at the college and also the long-term viability of the college's survival. I have colleagues who are really struggling with a lot of financial decisions of how their colleges have been impacted. So for me, it's thinking about we're here for students. We can continue to be here for students. How do we do that in a way that's still engaging them and it's still in, you know, making them feel like they're part of a Central Penn College family? And so how do, how do we do that in an online environment? Um, but it is, it is a difficult thing and you do have to play those scenarios out. I vision all the time and I vision every possible scenario. So Michael does work with me. He understands how I operate. I have a plan A, a plan B and a plan C. If we do plan A, here's all the positive possible outcomes. Here are the things that might be negative outcomes and what do we do about that? Then we go to plan B and here's the positive outcomes and here is the negative outcomes. And then looking for opportunities in each scenario. And I do play them out because if we can anticipate what some of the pitfalls may be to any decision or plan, then you can anticipate how to handle them. So a lot of visioning, a lot of conversations, a lot of writing things down for sure. Yeah. So, so Doug, now that we're, we're aware of these, these three levels of clarity, talk to us about how a business leader makes an effective decision. Well, we're ready to get down to it, Michael. Thank you. Uh, we, we know now that we have these three levels of clarity and we make sure we understand the issue we're facing. And we also know that we need to be systematic and slow about our thinking. So the next or the first real step in, in making a business decision is actually stating the issue, the problem or the opportunity. And I specifically say those three things because decisions aren't just about problems. Sometimes they're wonderful opportunities. Sometimes they're good problems, um, you know, expansion and growth and new ideas. Uh, so uh, we need to state the issue. We need to state it clearly. And, and I'd like to do that with a real brief story, if I could. About four years ago, I had the uh, president and CEO of a national firm ask me into his office. And he said, I've got a real problem. And this was only the second time we ever met. And he said, uh, I, Google reviews, my, my company is not getting good reviews from our customers online and I don't understand why. But I have brought in consultant after consultant to work on this problem and to teach our employees to provide better service and it's not improving. And I said, well, you state the problem as a customer service issue and you're trying to solve it as uh, automatically providing better service what if the problem isn't the employees? And he said, well, I, I never thought about that because he, he was more or less a fast thinker, not a slow systematic thinker. So we went to the root of the problem. And what we found out was that the problem had absolutely nothing to do with the people. It had to do with the process. Uh, their workflow dictated that the customer was basically um, communicated with or what we call touched anywhere from 10 to 24 times over several months. And in that flowing conversation to the customer, it felt like individual jagged conversations that were not well connected. So the customer didn't have a flow or a one continual conversation or experience with their company. They had 24 individual little conversations, some of which went well, some didn't. And usually in most cases, they had to go back to the beginning to start the conversation. Mm -hmm. It was very, very lacking in a, in a fluid nature. So the problem was being stated incorrectly, therefore the solution was not working. Once we were able to identify the true disease behind the problem, not the symptom, but the disease, and we were able to say your workflow promotes poor service, we were able to state the decision that had to be made. How will we solve this? And we knew we had a clearly identified problem. So to answer your question uh, with a story, that's, that's, that's a living, breathing example of what real business leaders go through. And it is very, very easy and very, very human to immediately assume that a customer service issue is exactly that. 
a lack of quality customer service when in fact it wasn't. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, stating the problem is is getting specific and really knowing what it is you're trying to decide. That's a really great insight, Doug, and one that I know I've confronted with clients numerous times as well. Jack, can you tell us uh, how can you uh, some tips on how you can do this well? How can you really get to the the root problem and not be just treating symptoms along the way? Sure. Yeah, this is this is a great place for the um, prescriptive part of it, where, where we're talking about the tools and techniques that decision makers can use. I I personally prefer the descriptive part, talking about how the mind actually works during this process. But there are some excellent tools and techniques that are available at any step along the decision-making process that, are, that can help managers and leaders clarify what it is they need to do. So things like checklists, um, pros and cons. I think Dr. Ferdrizzi, you were talking about pros and cons, right? That's a, I think Benjamin Franklin came up with that, that technique. Um, there's a five R technique. There's a root cause analysis technique. Uh, I, the five Y technique. I think a lot of people may be familiar with that technique. And that's just asking yourself why four or five times until you get to the root cause of, of the of the problem. Because like I've said, a lot of times we're focusing in on the symptoms and spending a lot of time and energy trying to solve the symptoms as opposed to the root cause. So I was in um, last term when we, we were still on campus having class, I was trying to think of an example I can give to my students of, of something like the five Y technique. And years ago, I played in a, I played in a band and we had a, a member of the band show up. Uh, he was unprepared. Uh, he was late. He didn't know the new songs that we were learning. So, you know, but that's not the problem. That's the symptom, right? So if we ask ourselves why a number of times, we can get to the root cause of that. So he's showing up unprepared. Why? Um, because he's not learning the songs. Why? Because he's not practicing on his own. Why? Because he has uh, a new job, a new job responsibilities, and that's forcing him to be on the road uh, most of the time. So, you know, there's the there's the root cause. Now, if I take that back to the beginning again, and let's say it goes in a different direction, he's unprepared. Why? Because he's not learning the songs. Why? Because he's not practicing. Why? Because he's looking to join another band and he's learning their songs. Those are two <laughs> different problems, right? In the first case scenario, well, maybe we can get somebody temporarily to fill in. Maybe we could just hold off and wait till his job slows down a little bit. Second scenario, we're saying, look, we need to go find somebody immediately. So if you use these techniques, it helps to clarify and really get away from the symptoms and move towards the root cause of the problem. That's a really, really helpful list. And, and we'll make sure that those are also available when we when we post the, uh, the interview here, because I think those are really great strategies to come back to. I know that our audience wants to know, Jack, what type of band was it? Was it ACD cover band? <laughs> oh, classic rock. Classic, classic rock. rock. We, we, yeah, did, we did everything from Johnny Cash to Pink. We did it. We did it all. <laughs> All right, we're going to make sure we when we get out of lockdown. There's no tape. Sure no tape exists of it either. So, yeah. <laughs> Don't go looking yeah. for it. <laughs> so, Linda, when we're facing a crisis like this, there are so many externalities, and you have to really keep it real and relevant to the situation. So, yeah. how do you take everything that's going on in a business or in a higher or a higher ed institution like Central Penn College, and you really try to help? it inform the decisions you're trying to make. So can you talk about maybe some some ways in which you are trying to take this whole multitude of circumstances and make something good come of it? Yeah, absolutely. So there's there's a whole number of things here. First of all, you're right. There's just do dozens of publications, dozens of higher ed institutions. I'm sorry, my dog. That's OK. Let me let him out of the room, obviously. For real. real. That's all right. Um, so for us. <laughs> There's, there's a couple of things. I think you have to take everything that you're getting and then pare it down to how it applies to you, right? So yeah, Central Penn College, we are a career-focused institution. A lot of these publications that are coming out with information about how they plan to reopen in the fall are very traditional institutions. 99% of their students are 18 to 24. We have an 18 to 24 population, but it's 14% of our institution. The rest of our institution are adults that have come back that want to upskill, that want to get some short-term certificates. So for us, we're using this time as an opportunity to say, there are a lot of people that need a lot of things right now. What can we provide to our local community um, to help them in this time? So we came up with a few things relatively quickly. Doug was one of the people that actually came to me and said, why can't we invite people into our classes if we have extra space 
that might want to learn about taking an online class or might want to brush up on some skills. They can't afford to take it for credit right now, but we can still give them some information. Beautiful idea. We opened it up into a professional enrichment opportunity overnight. We had 600 people contact us about wanting to take a class. The other thing we saw a need in the community for telemedicine and telehealth. People are afraid to leave their homes right now, and we're being told to stay in our homes if we can. So there's been a lot of um, loosening of laws and regulations to allow telemedicine and telehealth. But the reality is this is going to change how we see doctors moving forward more and more people are going to invest in telemedicine and telehealth. So we have a fantastic Dean of Health Sciences. She put together a five week non-credit course for anyone in the health industry to earn a non-credit certificate in telemedicine and telehealth that opens in May. So that was a way for us to provide something to our community. It was an opportunity that we saw that was also a need and we knew that we had the people on staff to be able to offer that to our community. So there are these opportunities that are buried in these times of crisis that you just have to be thinking of. Not like Doug said, not all decisions are bad ones. Some of them are how can we help and how can we become a leader during a crisis? So Doug, we, we just saw Linda illustrate for us how business leaders go from issue problem and then onto opportunity. So now that we, we know how to frame this, what's next? I, I just have to stop and say how uh, amazingly powerful it is that uh, five or 600 people who would not have been able to take a college course or didn't have uh, the, they weren't signed up for a college course and all of a sudden they're getting educated on something. I, Linda, I just think that's tremendously powerful and thank you for uh, facilitating that because it's a, that's just a huge plus for the community and uh, people at large. So, um, next, the next point is, yes, we, we've done our step one. We've stated our issue and we need to move on to the second step. And I'm, I'm, Linda, I'm going to use you as an example on this one. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to imagine that you have uh, this uh, large, beautiful office, which you do at work uh, in the Boyer House on the Central Penn campus. But imagine for a minute it has a series of large, beautiful windows that are framed wonderfully. And you have a decision to make and you walk over to the first window and you look through that frame and you look at that decision strictly from the perspective of human resources only, solely, nothing else in your mind. And then you mosey over to the second window and you can tell I came from a small town. Um, you mosey over to that second window <laughs> and you look out there and you say, gee whiz, now let's just think about this decision strictly and only solely from a financial standpoint. And then you walk over to the third window and you say, now operations, how would this decision affect operations? How would operations come into play? What would be the impact? What are the ramifications of it? Right. If you frame a problem in fundamental day-to-day -day terms, not in Jack's more scientific manner, but in day-to-day -day terms, the framing of a decision is literally taking your frames as a leader, depending on what they are. And Michael, you might have a completely different set of frames right. in your role, but for Linda, they would likely be uh, the departments or the functions of the company. So she could take a window for each report she has and say, that's a frame I must look at this problem through to make sure I see this, this issue or this decision from the viewpoint of each of my leaders. So uh, I think when we get to Linda, she can elaborate on that. But that is uh, exactly what I would call framing and, and framing a business decision as I teach it, which for me is step two. So let me go to Linda directly now and, and talk about that. So you, you've been faced with a lot of decisions recently. You also went through a strategic planning process last year, and you've had to make numerous choices about framing uh, issues and problems. How did the college do that? How did you do that as a leader? All right. So two part question. Um, what I would say is in response to the pandemic, Doug is right. Um, there are so many lenses to be looking through for every single decision. So just as an example, I sent a template to the cabinet yesterday and said, okay, we're going to look at planning for summer, look at planning for fall. And it had every one of their areas. 
How does this impact you if we offer classes completely online? How does this impact your area if we open in the fall? What resources do you need? There's literally nine frames on there. And then I need to look at the entire thing and make a decision on how to move forward. But Michael, you're right. Framing happens all the time. So with our strategic planning process, we framed it very differently. A lot of schools, um, they utilize a SWOT analysis, which is very typical. A lot of businesses, same thing. We took an issues-based approach and we took a frame of a very stark look at where we were on that day that we started our planning. We did not sugarcoat some of our problems. We laid it all out there and the frame was, this is who we are right now and what do we need to do and how do we take these issues and then frame it in a way to find opportunities within it. Because the way that you pose some of these questions and some of these issues are gonna impact how much buy-in you get from your constituencies. They wanna see that you're honest and you're real, but also that you're looking forward and you're not stuck in that frame or you're not stuck in your issues and your negativity, but that you're gonna find a way to find opportunities. So Jack, help us understand the science behind that. Yeah, that's um, yeah. It gets, so so I'll I'll take even a little narrower viewpoint than with with Doug said or Dr. Fergizi said. Um, so you have to watch the way in which the problem or challenge is presented or the manner in which it is presented too, um, because that could influence your your decision making process. So you know, simply utility theory says human beings will choose the option that provides them with the greatest value or the greatest benefit. Um, through the work of Kahneman and his colleagues, we find that we found out that that's not necessarily always true. When presented with two options, one providing more benefit, it's really the way in which it's stated, the, the, the individual will choose as opposed to what is providing them with the most benefit. So for example, if something is presented as a gain, um, we tend to go for the sure thing more often than not. If something is presented as a loss, we tend to be more riskier. So let me give you let me give an example of that. If I said oh, I'm going to give you two options, you could have a sure gain of $100 right now, or option B, 60% chance to win $200, 40% chance to win nothing. In 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 that's it's being framed as a gain. Most people will choose A. They'll take the sure thing, even though option two is going to give them more utility. There's there's more value in choosing option two, but they won't do it when it's phrased or presented as a game. Now the loss, it's it's different. So if I say, would you rather lose $100 right now or 60% chance to lose $200, 40% chance to lose nothing, people will choose option B in that case. They'll take the more risky choice when it's presented that way. So you really have to be, be aware in which way that you are you know, developing the problem or issue challenge and then presenting it. And there's also something that kind of ties into that. It's called priming. So there are certain words or phrases that could, could lead you to a certain conclusion. So if I say, how fast was the car going when it smashed into the other car versus how fast was the car going when it hit or it bumped the other car? You're gonna say it's going a lot faster if I say smashed as opposed to just hit or bumped. So the way, you know, framing through windows and different functional business functional areas, absolutely. And the people that are involved and then just the way, the manner in which the issue or challenge is presented, all of those things, play into ultimately your decision. Yeah, listen, I, I totally relate to that. And I've spent many years in communications and know fully well, you know, the frame of an issue can, you know, to get totally different responses. And I think as leaders too, right, we, uh, we're sometimes, you know, creating our own frames um, appropriately or inappropriately. And, you know, we're sometimes robbing ourselves of making a better decision because we kind of come at it with perhaps the wrong frame or uh, a frame that is not productive. And I wanna go back to Doug about that because so many times I've worked with business leaders who kind of tell me, well, you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. They, they tend to try to learn from history and sometimes not productively. They think that circumstances in the future will just be replicating conditions of the past. So Doug, talk to us more about how we can overcome some of those biases and assumptions that might compromise our business decisions. 
Well, Michael, it was just a few years back that I was sitting with the president of a, it was about a $110 million company at the time out in, in the Chicago area. And uh, a young lady walked through the door and she was a one of the leaders in the company. And she said, um, I, I need to talk to you about something before I leave. So he went ahead and let her have her conversation with him, with me sitting there, which was really advantageous and opportune. And what she brought to the table was that one of her directors just wasn't getting the job done. And she was very concerned about the well-being of this, um, this uh, leader in the company. And it was, it was a mid-level leader, not an entry-level leader. So it was somebody of, of a pretty significant value. And uh, they had a good bit invested in the employee they were speaking about. And she said, uh, I'm very concerned about her performance. I want you to know that I'm aware it's not been the greatest. And I'm working on it. And and he was immediately very, very stern. He said, listen, I want to tell you something. The last three times we continued to try to rehabilitate an employee and they weren't performing, we ended up terminating them anyhow, and we wasted all the time we spent trying to rehabilitate them. I'm not willing to make that mistake again, get rid of her. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting because history had obviously had an impact on this this pre this company president. And I knew what was happening. A, a bias was kicking in in a big way. And I waited until he was alone again and we talked about it. And, and I asked him, um, do you do you really believe that because this happened in the past, it's exactly what will happen with this young lady, uh, this director that you're concerned about? And he said, well, yes. He said, I, I've wasted my time three times. I'm not willing to waste it again. So he was absolute and resolute in his, in his thinking. And I said, do me a favor. Just ask the young lady who was just in here to please go and speak very candidly to the director in question and get to the bottom of why this performance is not where it should be, because I didn't hear a true explanation. So he did. He asked her to do that. And she came back uh, and quickly was in tears because, as it turned out, uh, the director who was not performing had found out that her sister had cancer. Mm. And she was completely distracted by that situation. Now, this director had been a rock star since the day she walked through the doors of this company. And we were ready to throw her out in the street and make her unemployed and make her the valuable asset of another company as soon as her sister was hopefully healthy again. Uh, so uh, a very important lesson learned that director was given another chance. She was rehabilitated. They did work with her. They were patient with her and she continued to be a valuable asset for the company. That would not have happened if we would have allowed bias to dictate the situation. So having said that, I'll let uh, I'll let uh, uh, Jack and Linda put meat on the bones of that story. Well, you know what? That's a, you know maybe a really interesting point and a future lesson for coming out of this crisis, right? There's going to be so many things that people are carrying with them and returning to work, and we're going to have to really dig deep and dig into, you know, what is the motivation? What's the real reason here that someone may not be performing or may be struggling either in their remote assignment or coming back to work, or maybe they're their, their hesitation to coming back to work. Some people might inappropriately assign laziness or they're not interested in their job anymore when they may, they may be some very serious health concerns they have for themselves or a family mem member. Jack, talk to us about the difference between a bias and a heurist heuristic when it comes to um, making these decisions and why um, or what, what most often haunts business leaders in these decision-making environments. Okay, so so let's first define judgment before we get to heuristics and biases. Judgment the judgment is that that cognitive process that goes on as you're making a decision. So all a, all a heuristic is is a, sh a shortcut in that judgment. So you know, making these decisions, processing the information, we're using a lot of energy. Your brain is consuming a lot of glucose. So you you know, it it's it makes sense to have some shortcuts as you're trying to make these decisions, and within those heuristics. That's where the biases tend to emanate from. So as we're making these shortcuts, we tend to develop these these biases. And I think you know, Doug and I were working on a project, and I think we we identified something like 124 biases from the literature. So I'm <laughs> I'm certainly not going to cover um, all of those biases right now. But I think there's a few um, that certainly could could um, leaders should be aware of as they're making uh, the decision. The first one is. Um, 
it's a heuristic, it's availability heuristic. And it's, um, we tend to use readily available information, whether it's something we just heard or whether it's something that we have planted in our mind as kind of a baseline for the decision that we make, right? So I do this little exercise in class where I have students generate a random four digit number um, from, you know, going starting from zero, going up to 2020. And those students, and then I ask them after they get that number, I say, then I need you to estimate the year the Taj Mahal was built, right? So students that have a very, very low number, their guess about when the Taj Mahal was built was, was at a very early time period. Those that are maybe closer to 2020 will guess a, a later time period. So that just having that available information in your head provides a baseline that you use unknowingly to inform your, your decision. The next one I would say is the is the confirmation bias. And this is a big one. We tend to seek out information that confirms what we already think or believe. So if I think uh, businesses or the school should be opening up um, sooner rather than later, I will gravitate towards certain information or news outlets that are that's going to confirm what it is that I'm I already think or I think I know. Versus if I think we should be in lockdown a little longer and social distancing, I'm going to gravitate to, towards um, those those news outlets. So that's the um, that's that, that's that confirmation bias. So I would highly recommend people to, you know, really source that. And, and I think Dr. Fredriz, you mentioned that early in your in your in your talk that you're searching out different sources of information. That's so important right now because like, you know there, there's there's a lot of biased information out there. And and the last one. Um, I think is is the one that, that uh, Bazerman and Moore call the granddaddy of them all, overconfidence. So that's where we just have a little too much belief in our own abilities and our ability to process information and make decisions, and that we we're better at that than other people. And there's a whole lot of biases that flow from that, including overestimation and things like that. So um, I would say those three are the availability, confirmation, and overconfidence are ones that that leaders should be aware of, certainly in, in these times. So, Linda, I'm going to go to you next. I mean, you, you can respond to that and also, you know, how are you trying to ensure that you are not falling prey to biases or to any of the heuristics that are part of decision making among the, our colleagues at Central Penn? Right. And then maybe also talk to us about a little bit of kind of trying to break from, you know, the fears of history, the lessons of the college so that they are, that you are leading in ways that are as we started off the conversation by saying, this is unlike anything we've ever seen before. Sure. So how can we truly have new thinking right now and, and decisions you're making? Well, confirmation bias is very real. And, and what I could tell you is I seek out a variety of input because I know the information I'm getting back is the information that best suits that person in his or her area. So the crazy thing about bias is people don't often realize they have it. So I will get all this information from people and it'll tell me what's best for them, um, but it's not necessarily what's best for the college. So you have to take all of that information and look at it holistically to make the best determination for everybody. Um, and you can't be too extreme. That's the other thing I will tell you with this pandemic that's crazy is you're also balancing the people who don't want to leave the house, don't ever want to reopen again, think we should close for a year and a half. And then the other people who are like, just open the doors. This is all this is all made up. Right. So you have to find the, the middle in there, too, and, and take take what you're getting with a grain of salt. I will tell you that um, you can't always base decisions on what worked before or what didn't work before at, at Central Penn College, the college well in its history when it first started was very good at certificates, right? Short-term certificates, long-term certificates, um, short programs. Then there was a decision made uh, a few leaders ago about having more programs and getting rid of certificates altogether. And really it was just focused on the associates, the bachelors, the masters, which all made sense at the time. You can't always disregard um, a new idea or an idea that you did before because it didn't work before. What were the circumstances for the college at that time? Very different than what the circumstances are for the college right now. Right now, we know that people in our area want to get jobs and we know that they're looking for shorter term certificates. They may already have their bachelor's degree but want to get into something new. So maybe it's three or four courses instead of having to get 60 credits or 120 credits. So we've made 
a really deliberate decision to start adding back some of those short term certificates. And that's different than it was here just 10 years ago. So you have to be willing to take a look at what circumstances you are in in the moment and what's happening regionally and globally and not just what didn't work 10 years ago. So, um, Doug, talk to us about what's next then. I mean, we're, you know, 40 minutes into our conversation, 50 minutes into the conversation. We're getting towards the end of this process. Um, so what's next in, in making good decisions? Well, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll combine two steps here, Michael, and say the next step you have to do is you have to list your options. And this is where the importance of stating the the original issue, problem, or opportunity is very critical because if you don't do that properly, your list will not work because you'll be addressing the wrong thing. And we talked about that with the uh, the president and CEO that was solving a customer service problem with uh, customer service consultants when the problem wasn't the actual service. It was actually the workflow. Uh, so obviously his list of stated uh, opportunities or options to solve the, the problem or make a decision were not proper. So you have to make sure you have the right thing. But most importantly, you need to make sure they align with the opportunity. So um, when you're thinking about uh, an underperforming uh, senior vice president of sales. We'll just make that as an example. A corporate CEO or president has to deal with an underperforming senior vice president of sales. Um, they might initially say, I have three options available to me. I can, the, the three R's we call them, I can relive it, which means tolerate it, or I can rehabilitate it and make it better, or I can replace it and make a change mm -hmm. uh, and, and just completely start from scratch and, get, and get going again in a different way. And you have one of those those three R's, but you might find through really being cognitive about, about those three options that reliving it is not an option. Uh, if you have a problem and you continue to exercise the same behavior and you think something's gonna change, well, we all know what that's the definition right. of. So uh, option one actually goes out the window and now we have two options, rehabilitate or replace. And uh, now we have a viable list of alternatives. So the next step is to list the options available. And then the, the final step uh, that I like to take before, um, before wrapping up and actually making a decision is I filter the decision. So if I'm down to the point where I've said, okay, my two choices are to rehabilitate or replace that particular senior vice president, and I am leaning towards making a replacement, uh, bringing in a different person and either assigning them to other duties or uh, terminating them and letting them leave the company and be free to go somewhere else and be a star. Um, if replacement is the way I'm leaning, I need to filter that decision. And I have a filter I've used for 20 something years uh, in the business world. I've taught it to a lot of people and it starts with P, which is precedent. What precedent do I set when I make this decision? Risk, what risks come with making this decision? Uh, what are the implications of making this decision to the other vice presidents of sales, um, for example? Um, then I would say, uh, collaboratively, do I have the right people in the room when I'm making this decision? Do I have the people I need to speak to? And what about my core values? It, it, Linda referred to this earlier, and it's so critical. Uh, could I compromise the actual core values of my organization by making a decision? If I do, that's the wrong decision. There's no question about that because right. core values are, are non-negotiable. Uh, and then finally, who would need to know about that decision and does it compromise the safety of our employees? So that ends up with what we affectionately call the pricks filter and not to be a prick about it, but the fact is, <laughs> uh, our ICCKS is my filter, and we've called it the Pricks filter for 20-something years, and uh, we use it to filter our decisions and uh, make them intelligently. And honestly, I, I it scares me, but I I really don't do anything without. And, and you can you can use you can develop your own filter, and you can use it in seconds. It takes one to two seconds to run a decision through that filter. It becomes second nature. So the next two steps for me are list the options and then filter that decision carefully to make sure I'm at the right decision. So I it really, in the interest of time, I'm going to go right on to decision making, Doug, and say that, you know, I recognize that we all recognize that, you know, making decisions is an art form, uh, that there is a there's a certain level of science, but there is also a little level of art in this. 
So can you um, help us to see, um, you know, when when decision times are, arrives, like what what else is there to do? Is is that the end of it? Is is there something else you do once you know you've read in time to make a decision? What, what's next? Yeah, that's, not, that's not it for me, Michael. Uh, at that point, I go back and say to myself, did I truly think fast or think slow in making this decision? Did I truly avoid heuristics and biases that could have uh, that could have been made me vulnerable to making a decision that I would regret later? And then I go to step three of clarity. Uh, I want that level three clarity. So this is the point where I like to sit down with a coach and say, here's how I feel about this decision. Here's the decision I'm prepared to make. And by the time it's out of my mouth, I know it is or is not the right decision. Uh, just verbalizing it and getting it out there really, uh, really helps me make sure that I've confirmed that, that I am comfortable with it. And then like Linda said, you have to get on with it. You have to make that decision. You have to make move forward, and then you have to debrief it and assess it later to make sure you're learning from the quality of the decisions you have made. And um, that's that's it. That's the process. And and it's really not very many steps. This sounds like a lot, but if you think about it, you can go through all of the steps in this process in a very very short period of time. This is not time consuming once you learn to do it. The only thing that takes time is the learning. But once you've mastered this art of decision making, um, it becomes very much second nature and you can do it very efficiently. But think about this for a minute. What's the value of the little bit of time you invest in learning it and exercising it every time as opposed to making more profitable business decisions for your company on an ongoing basis? Yeah. There's no comparison. I've had business Business owners tell me continually that they absolutely positively make hundreds of thousands of dollars in additional or replacement profit every year. And that's profit, not revenue, because they've learned to make more effective business decisions. So in a time of crisis, there's not only reputation on the line, but a tremendous amount of uh, opportunity and profit as well. So Jack, bring us in for a landing on that. There, there's a certain level of science too when you reach the time to make a decision. Lots of people struggle with pulling the trigger, feeling confident and not renegotiating. So kind of what what's the science behind that and how can we as leaders make sure that we you know, can feel and rest easy once the decision time is, is there? Yeah, I, I don't know if there's if there's a, a you know something that'll say here's here's how you know it's the right answer and then the sunshine and rainbows and we know we did the right thing right there's right um, there's there's really there's there's learning that can take place right after we make our decision we we implement and we we take that feedback and we can certainly use that to inform. Um, what we've done and it, did it work or didn't it work? But you know what? What Doug said, I think, is is right on the money. Where, you know, we really have to slow down. Engage system two. Gather as much information as we can. Surround yourself with a with a great team. And that's what Dr. Fredrizzi said early. And, you know, look for you know there's there's and you can choose any any metrics you want for your team members. But you know maybe maybe creative thinkers, innovative styles where you have people who could clarify the problem. You have people who are big picture thinkers who could who really um, could take what the analyzers do and say, okay, let's think out of the box a little bit. Developers who could take that and really get down into the weeds and and figure out, uh, develop an idea out of that. And then implementers and then integrators who are comfortable with everybody and keep the process moving. Um, I would also say in that process, have they have somebody like a devil's advocate all the time. Somebody who just, even if everybody is on the same page and say, yes, we all agree, just designate somebody and say, look, shoot some holes in this. We need somebody who could just come at us with a counter argument on any of the issues. If nothing else, just to get us to slow down even a little more and make sure we're thinking our thinking our way through this. And then I think if you do that, if you do all of those steps, I think you'll be more comfortable with your decision. Is, is it always going to be the right decision? Absolutely not. Um, and, and real quick, going back to with Doug's um, Doug's filtering, the pricks filter, it's like what Doug calls it. You, you know, you have to really think about, you know, first of all, the implementation of your solution. Who is that going to impact? Because we're investing a lot of time, a lot of energy, and there may not be people on board with what you're going to implement. So you may be losing some people or wasting money. Also, the solution itself. Will the solution itself have an impact 
on people where, again, maybe people don't buy in or there's some resistance to change and, and you're, you might also lose some good people there too. So, um, you know, that's why that, that doing the filtering right before is a, is a tremendous exercise. And then if you've done all your homework, hopefully that decision-making process is, is a slightly easier. And Michael, yeah. if, I could add, if I could add one little thing to that, yeah. Linda, Linda used the phrase uh, career focused or career based numerous times on this call. I think what's really interesting about the business decision making process, and, and this speaks to that, is that what we teach in the classroom at Central Penn College is identical to what we teach a, a $250 million CEO. Uh, of a, a very large company. It's the exact same process. Uh, what we're teaching in the classroom is this process. And uh, it's it's identical to what we teach to the actual CEO. So there's there's no difference there. And I think that's significant to the uh, the learning experience and the, the educational component of this whole thing. That's a great point. And the quality of education at Central Penn College is tremendous. And it is reassuring to know that, you know, classes continue even today and um, that our uh, spring term will continue on until the end of June. And then we will we have a, a summer term that will be beginning. And I know that uh, Dr. Vadrizi is making plans with the with the board of directors and with her cabinet as as we speak about, you know, how the college is going to continue to operate and ensure that quality education is available for those uh, who are enrolled now or who are looking for options. Uh, for the future, either because they are looking for a higher ed institution or they might be facing joblessness or, or layoff and are looking to, to upskill or train in this really uncertain time. So just Linda, close with saying, you know, how are you making those decisions? How are you using filtering and what strategies will you ensure to make that the, the, the decisions you're going to make about reopening be the best ones uh, for, for not just the college, but for the, everyone you serve? Sure. So it's it's combining everything that we've talked about today. It's doing your homework, making decisions based on accurate data that you're gathering, gaining the counsel from people from different areas. Um, for us, what we're doing is we're creating a four scenario chart. It's literally playing out. This can go in four different ways. One thing's not changing. The quality of the education is never changing. So we know that we have that, which is the part that makes us feel good. And we know we can deliver that in any way. The question is, how do we deliver it in four different scenarios? Face-to-face, <laughs> -face, online, a hybrid model, some students in class, some students at home. Those are the details we have to work out. But at the core of who we are and what we do, what our mission is, what our values are, if we're staying true to that and making decisions based on all of the other facts and data that we have, it's not that difficult. So having a system of tracking, making sure that the safety and the health of our students and our, our staff is, is first and foremost. Um, tracking symptoms, allowing students who have symptoms to stay home, but they can still continue their education online. Weekly meetings with the COVID-19 task force, weekly meetings with the cabinet. And then ultimately, what do we learn from this? I think there are lessons that we look back on. Doug's right, it's not over once you make the decision. There are things we've learned working remotely that are actually working better for us as an organization. We have some staff that are more productive and are doing a better job at home than the distractions in their office. So can we make further decisions down the road? And then the other thing I would say is at the end of the day, if you are a CEO, you're a person in a supervisory role, you have to make decisions. You have everything coming at you. You take all of that information, but at the end of the day, you are the one that's going to be accountable. So it needs to be a decision that does not compromise your values or the mission of your organization and something that you can live with and sleep on at night. So you have to be able to take that full accountability too. And that's that's truly a, a, a great exclamation point for our conversation today. I wanna thank Doug, Jack and Linda for the time today. I think this has been truly insightful. Um, if you found our conversation to be helpful and motivating to continue to develop your own business decision-making skills, you might want to check out Central Penn. Um, we have more online uh, learning and in-person learning, hopefully soon, that will be coming your way. You can learn more about studying and learning with these professionals by visiting centralpenn.edu and learning more about our degree and non-degree programs that are continuing to this day. I'm Michael Fedor. Thanks for joining us. Stay home, stay safe, and stay strong.